So glad you're here at renovation this morning at eight o'clock. Nice and early, we had a great uh, sunrise as Pastor D said. Uh, I'm the associate pastor here. My name's Hayden Dennis. Uh, so glad you're here. And we got to talking about what we was gonna do to accommodate, hopefully, uh, everybody that's gonna show up today. So we decided to do four services. And so I told Pastor D, I'm like, I'll take uh, one of them and you can have the other two. So here I am. Um, but uh, this is probably one of my favorite holidays, in all honesty. I love this time of year, um, not only just because of what he did in this time of year, but I just love this time of year, spring and rebirth and new and uh, seeing everything come. But man, hasn't uh, this holiday, if you want to call it Easter, Resurrection Sunday, whatever, hasn't this holiday changed a lot in the last little bit? Like when we were kids, stuff has gotten a lot better. It's really not fair. Um, I'm a little bit older, so my kids are older, but like when I was a kid, the only egg we had was one that we had to do and boil it. And if you hit it and didn't find it, you're going to find it, right? And then I don't even talk about like actually trying to color them on the little bitty, it wouldn't even stay on it, you know? Like it was just sitting there rolling around, you drop it in there. By the time you're done, you're colored up. Now they got these plastic eggs, they got candy in them, got money in them. Like, yeah, what? Yeah. <laughs> so things have gotten better. You know, the candy, don't even get started on the candy. We had the Cadbury egg with this weird yellow and white goo in the middle. You can't tell me the Reese's egg is not better than Cadbury. Far above. Now, Cadbury did pick it up, right? They got a caramel egg. So, but, so the candy's even better. We've had all these advancements in this holiday on a secular side. The, the outfits. Tara's got a picture. Tell me this ain't scary. <laughs> the bunny outfits are even better now. We did have one that looked kind of that way. So my point about we've had all this progress about this holiday and all this but why is so many of our young people and so many of us more stressed, more anxiety, more this, more that? You look at the world right now, anxiety is up, stress is up, loneliness up, suicide up. Sounds like a great Sunday sermon, doesn't it? But with all this going, getting better in our lives, why are we going the wrong way? You want to know why? You want to know what's going down, why everything else is going up? People are reading the Word of God. People are reading the Word of God is plummeting. The number of people reading the Bible in just the U.S. is plummeting. Ignorance about the Word of God is on the rise. And I'll be honest, it's a lot of pastors and churches' fault, too. It's not just the people. Ignorance is of the Word of God is on the rise. American Bible Society did a survey on how often do you read the Bible? 40% said never. I didn't get surveyed, but so I sometimes always wonder where these surveys come from, but they did a survey, 40% never, and among the young, they asked why. Gen Z said they don't know where to start. Pastor D, maybe that Gen Z Bible will help. I don't know. But they, it's not that they don't want to read it. They don't know where to start. They don't know what to do to start. Harvard not known to be a real staunch biblical college, right? Harvard's pretty liberal college. Harvard has a program called the Human Flourishing Program. They released a study in 2020 that found a strong correlation between interacting with scriptures and hope. Harvard did. It says women, here's some of the results from this study. Frequent Bible readers are 33% more hopeful than regular scripture readers. Not 33% more hopeful than nobody that reads. Frequent reading, you're 33% more hopeful. Women who attend church service once a week show a 68% lower risk of death from despair. This is Harvard giving these results. Men, 33% less. Weekly attendance to church reduces mortality by 20 to 30%. So if you're sitting here today in this room 
And the only reason you're here is because somebody invited you. They literally are extending your life by you being here, and that's a Harvard study fact. Going to church will extend your life. Maybe not shepherding one. All right? Nobody got it. Pastor D got it. But at going to church, if someone invites you today, it literally is extending your life. So here we are, Resurrection Sunday. Resurrection Sunday. Oh, it's all about hope. Pastor Tucker's praying there. It's all about hope. There's a couple ways you can preach a sermon like this. One's the apologetics route where we just go through the Bible and I try to just prove what happened. The other one's more of an emotional, you know, relational, where I just kind of tell the story. But I'm going to try something totally different today. I'm going to talk about, and this hit me when I was doing a big study in Thessalonians. And in 1 Thessalonians, is where we're going to be today. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We, we'll get you one. Don't be ashamed at all if you didn't bring one and want one. We got some we'll give you. But this church in Thessalonica, it reminds me a lot of our church. It really does, because it was a church that was just exploding a church that was growing. It was a young church. The Bible says it was a young church. It was very successful economically, not necessarily us. But that, that part didn't hit us, but that's okay. God has always provided. I promise you that. But this church in Thessalonica is a young church. It's a successful economical church. It's influential politically, and it was in a city that was very, very secular. Can anybody imagine that? Isn't every church in America in a city that's secular? Like, that's, what it, that's where we're at. And this is where they were. But Paul, Paul's t- talking to this church. He said to this church that they turned from their idols and started following the one and true God. They quit chasing the world and they started chasing God. And that's where Paul's talking about. But as I started studying it, I got to realizing, like, there's three times that Paul hits on this weekend when he's talking to them. He's literally talking about this resurrection time, this cross and this grave and the resurrection, he talks about to the, the Thessalonians, and that's what I want to hit on today. So I'm gonna, we're going to read the three scriptures where he talks about it, and then we're going we're gonna to break it down a little bit. So in 1 Thessalonians 1, is where we're going to be, 9 and 10, and she'll have it on the screen. It says, For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, and how you turn to God from your idols to serve a living and true God, and you wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. That's this weekend. He raised him from the dead. You're waiting on Jesus to come back, and why is he coming back? Because he's already been raised from the dead. It's what we're talking about. It's this hope we have this weekend that we're talking about. We have it all year. First Thessalonians 4.14, Paul mentions it again. It says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus, right? He's talking about it again. He's telling the Thessalonians about this, this resurrection weekend. If we believe that Jesus died and he rose again. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's Paul talking to the Thessalonians. He's talking about this is what happened on this weekend, and this is what they're going to be talking about 2,000 years later in a little church in Mansfield, Missouri. They're going to keep talking this story because it's an old story that gives us fresh hope for our future. If you truly understand it, all of our future hope is in this story right here. I want to look at these scriptures chronologically today and just paint a picture of this old story, this old story for a fresh hope in our lives. And as we go through it, I want you to look for four things. I'm not a big point, Pastor, but I got four things I want you to look for as we're going through this. And four things I want you to see is, number one, there's a comfort for suffering. Number two, there's a reason for living. Number three, there's an anchor for justice. And number four, there's a hope for the future. So as we're going through, listen for these things. Because back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we hear Paul teaching that God's son from heaven died. Guys, that's a crazy story. God's son from heaven died. That's what Paul is teaching the Thessalonians, that this is what happened. This is crazy to think, not only that his son died, but just think about this, how crazy that he came and he just walked on the earth with us. Think about this as we're going through this. It's a strange, crazy story, but I'm gonna tell you something, crazy sells. 
You want to catch somebody's attention, you tell a crazy story, right? What's crazier than the God that created everything, the one that made everything, he come and he walked among us. Not only that, he died. Guys, that's crazy. But people, you'll catch their attention with it. He stepped into our story, literally stepped into our story. He steps into the scene and then he died. And Paul's telling him this, it's crazy. But it gets crazier, right? Because what happens in three days? Shana, get up and dance. Nothing. She sends a video of a guy talking about when they say three days, you're supposed to get up and dance in church on Resurrection Sunday, but she didn't do it. So it's get, the story gets crazier. Three days later, he's risen back from the dead, right? Empty tomb. That's why we celebrate. And he took this pain and all this suffering. He takes all this that we deserved. We deserved every bit of that, and he took it all. And what does that give us? A comfort in our suffering. Because here's the deal. We're still going to suffer here. We're still going to suffer this side of heaven. But we have a comfort in that suffering because guess what? He's already conquered all of it. He's already given us hope in this. So we have a comfort. He's paid the ultimate price because the ultimate price was paid. I can have comfort even when I see suffering happen in my life because I know in the end, I'm gonna win too. I'm gonna end up where he's at. In the end, whatever happens, I'm gonna make it because of what he did. See, the Thessalonians were constantly worshiping other idols. They were constantly worshiping other idols, paying, paying, basically paying money to these false gods so they would have basically to get them out of trouble and to have a better life. They were always looking at de another deity so they would leave them alone. They would pay money. But then God stepped in the story because Paul says, you have left your other idols to follow what? The true God. He stepped in the story. He died for us. See, that's the difference. He died for us. That means that involves us. That means that connects us. He didn't just die. Just dying really doesn't mean nothing. But if you die for something or someone, then that involves us. There's a destroyer in the naval fleet called the USS Michael Monsoor. That's the picture of it. It's one of the biggest destroyers in our naval fleet. It's named after Navy SEAL Michael Monsoor. I'm going to read a story about Michael. Monsoor enlisted in the Navy in 2001 and became a Navy SEAL in 2004. On the day he was killed in Ramadan, he was part of a sniper overwatch security position with two other Navy SEALs and four Iraqi Army soldiers when an insurgent threw a grenade at the team according to the naval uh, events. Positioned next to the single exit, Monsieur was the only one who could have escaped harm, according to the Navy's descriptions. Instead, he dropped on the grenade, smothering it to protect his teammates. The grenade detonated and as he came down on top of it, inflicting a mortal wound. Monsieur's actions saved the lives of two teammates and the accompanying Iraqi soldiers. At his Medal of Honor ceremony, President George Bush was quoted, one of the survivors of that day, who said, Mikey looked death in the face that day and said, you cannot take my brothers, I will go in their place. Dying for someone changes it. It connects you to the story forever. When you understand that he died for you on the cross, it connects you in the story. It involves you, you're part of it. If you've accepted, you're part of it. And to be honest, if you didn't accept, you're still part of it because he did it for everybody. He did it for the ones that hate him. He did it for the ones that don't believe him. He did it for the whole world. Sometimes that's hard to, I mean, we always say make it personal, which is very true. We should make it personal. But we also need to understand he did it for all mankind, all. But when you die to save someone, it's different. In John 15, 13, it says, greater love no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. When you die for someone, it changes the story. We've got comfort in our suffering because God entered our story. He stepped on scene on the earth and he became death for us. It changes it. It changes when someone dies for you. 
But then the story gets crazier, right? He didn't just die. Back in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, it says, and to wait for his son from heaven who was raised from the dead. That's Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. He didn't just die for us, but he was brought out of the grave three days later for us. That story gets crazier, but he was brought out for us. Listen, if he just died, he would be like all the other false gods that are out there. Muhammad's gone. You can look through them all. He's the only one that was raised back. He was raised because that is where our salvation rests. That's where our hope rests. There's a hope and a possibility for him. There was a hope when he went in that grave. He knew, even though he knew he was coming back, he didn't want to go there, but he had a hope because he knew he was coming back in three days. You know, because of that hope, we know that we will be coming out of that grave. Some of us won't even make the grave. We're going to get raptured. But there's a hope for us. There's a hope in our suffering because we know he beat the grave we're going to beat the grave. That's right. Get excited for it. The hope and the possibility for him gave us hope. Hope begins to rise up in us when we understand there is comfort in his resurrection. You will have hope in your life when you understand that there is a comfort that he came out of that grave. Not that he died, but that he came out of that grave for you. It's hard to understand everything in death, but the end of death was not the end for him and it's not gonna be for you. And that's all we can hang our hat on. There was a hope for him, there was a hope for us. So because of that, we've got a reason for living right now. We have a reason for living right now. In 1 Thessalonians 4:14, 4, it says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. It's as simple as believing that this crazy story happened for you. It's as simple as believing that he took the nails, that he died, that his blood atonement had to happen for sin because there's nothing we could do to conquer that sin for you. It's that simple. That's why we sing. That's why we worship. When you come in here to do sing and praise and worship, we should worship because the hero showed up and he died and he rose for me. And because I believed, I'm now part of him. That's why we come in here and worship. That's why we should sing. That's why we should pray and thank him constantly. That's why we should tell people. That's why we should tell others that are looking, searching for anything in this world that makes sense. Anything. Because we were created, first of all, whole. And through Adam, we lost a part. And we literally have a hole in our life that has to be filled with something. The human nature in us is constantly trying to fill that hole with something. The world fills it with everything else. And if you're a believer in here, we have to fill it with him. That blood atonement, that's what we, if we believe that he died and rose again. 1 Thessalonians 5.10 says, who died for us, Jesus. So whether awake or asleep, we will live with him basically forever. We're going to live together with him. The reason he entered our story, the reason he entered was so we could live together with him forever. The reason for the cross, the grave, the empty tomb is so we can have fellowship later on forever. It's the reason we get our hope now though. That's the thing, we don't have to just wait for them. We can live out this hope now because that's what people are starving for is to see a hope in us. They're not looking for Christians to go on Facebook and bash other churches because they're not gonna use the word resurrection on Sunday. I'm not happy about it either, but it's not my church. We're going to use it here. That's all I can care about. Getting on Facebook and bashing somebody about it doesn't help necessarily. We've got to stand on the truth, and we're going to stand on the truth in here for sure. But so why did, why did he have to die that way? Why the cross? Why was it that way? And this is where we start talking about that anchor for justice. Man, do we like to see justice as a human being, Right? Man, we start seeing wrong in the world. We start seeing our friend do something wrong. We want to see some justice happen. Some righteous justice needs to come down on these people. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, And to wait from his son from heaven who is raised from the dead, that is Jesus who rescues us from what? The wrath to come. We don't preach about wrath a lot. I doubt there's too many pastors preaching on wrath on a Sunday morning when you have a lot of visitors at church. Doesn't typically happen. 
but I think we need to talk about wrath because we all have wrath in our lives and when we see something wrong, we want something to happen. Um, we feel wrath and we want justice for anything injustice that we believe we see, right? It's what we want. So where did we get this universal standard of justice? Where did it come from? You ever thought about that? Where do we judge it from? People say all the time, how can you believe in a God with so much suffering and injustice in the world? How many in here has heard that? I've heard it. We hear it all the time, right? We give it, we get our justice from this universal law of the giver. It's all his. He created it. He designed it. He's still in control of it. He owns it all. So the difference is we shouldn't be angry at God. We're angry with God. God is a God of holy. He's a God of just. The things that are happening, he's not okay with. If you read the scriptures and you see what God stands on, that he's holy and just, he's not okay with it. So we're not mad at God when things happen. We're mad with him because, listen, he's mad too. He is not happy. I promise he's not happy right now about the injustice, the suffering, the abuse, the violation of people he designed, right? He designed everybody. We've already talked about it. Everybody was created in his image. You tell me he's happy that some of these people are getting abused? Violated? No, he's not. That's why we see evil run rampant. We're like, or bad things happening. We want somebody to step in, right? Somebody step in, intervene. This isn't right. Government, make this stop. Official, blow the whistle. I officiate basketball all the time. Are you going to call something? Right? See something going wrong, we want somebody to intervene. God, step in. But then when God steps in, in his holiness, and in his perfection, we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You, you grade on a curve, right? It's a sliding scale. I mean, I want, I want justice for what they're doing wrong, but can you not look at mine? See, he's a, he's a perfect God, and when he steps in, there's this justice that's found because there is no unjust in him. He's holy. You know, you look at the Old Testament, you're like, how did he do all that? He's protecting the seed. He's protecting, he's holy. He can't let that seed continue and try to penetrate through to Jesus. He's, it's all about holiness. He has no wrong in him. But when we see other people sin, we want them to pay for their sins or wrongdoing. We want them to pay for and, and have this justice, but we never want him to look at us. But see, if we're gonna have justice, something had to pay the price. Someone had to pay the price. That's the good news of today. Jesus paid the price. He paid the price. That's why we can have this anchor for justice. He paid the price for sin. He paid the price in your life for sin. He paid it for everybody in the whole world's sin. So we have this anchor of justice. That's why we can be just about stuff. We're like, hey, this is not the right thing happening. And this is why. Right here in scripture, it says this can't be happening. And this gives us the anchor. So how do we know that the payment was enough? We got an anchor for our justice. How do we know that the payment was enough? How do we know that it was sufficient? How do we know that the cross, the brutalness that happened, the blood that was shed for our, for our atonement, how do we know that it was enough? Three days later, there's an empty tomb. Yeah, three days later, there's an empty tomb. Like that's how we know that the payment was sufficient because he did rise again. Guys, it's a crazy story. But man, he did it for you. And he did it for me. So what are we doing with it? You know, I knew this group was, for the most part, I knew we'd have some vision stuff, but for the most part, eight o'clock, it's pretty well your solid, solid bunch. But what are we doing with this, this information that we have? What are we doing with this crazy story? Have we told anybody? Because this is what gives us the last thing is a hope for our future. The only hope we have is in the cross. We have no hope in this world. Have you been outside? It's bad. And if you read the Bible, it's gonna get worse. He's coming for his church, I don't know when. It doesn't say how much more we'll see before we get there, but it's gonna get worse. 
But this cross, this grave, and this resurrection is our hope for the future. And it's our hope that we can go and we can tell other people what he did for us, what he did for you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's not destined us for wrath. Are we going to suffer? Yes. Suffering and wrath, two different things. Guys, I never want to experience the wrath of God. And I believe right here is a prime example of why I believe he's taken the church out before. Because right here he says, we're not destined for wrath. And he's talking to the believers here in Thessalonica. He's talking to people that have accepted Christ, his church, his bride. And this is one of the best scriptures right here that he's going to take us out before that. And it could happen at any time. The Bible says that. But not wrath in this life. We're not destined for wrath in this life. We have salvation through Jesus Christ, not in eternity, but I want you to start living out that right now. Don't just look towards eternity because, oh, well, I'm saved. I'm going. Now it doesn't matter. Let them get their justice over there. They don't want to follow. I don't really care about them. No, we're supposed to walk out our salvation every day here. We're supposed to have a smile on our face more than not. And not like I'm holier than you. You need this because look at me, look at me, look how good I am. No, it's because I'm a mess. But because of the blood, because of the empty tomb, I have hope. There's a hope in me because of that. There's a powerful hope in the empty tomb, which is all about Sunday. It's all about today. We talk about the death and the cross, but it's all about the empty tomb. Can you imagine when they ran up to that empty tomb, not really knowing if they really took him or if he really, re- did he really do what he said he was going to do? You know, we, 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 like, we tell people, like, I don't understand why you can't just believe. Guys, they were there and some of them had struggles believing. But when the Holy Spirit starts settling in your heart and starts showing you that this is the way, this is the only way, through Jesus, it changes everything. It's a powerful hope to understand that death is coming for each one of us. Death is coming for me and you. The Bible says death is coming for us. Death came for him. But see, that hope is that death didn't just come for him, but he beat it. And you're going to beat it. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior in here, you're going to beat it. You're going to beat the death. You're going to beat everything because he came and he died for you. It's not your standard Resurrection Sunday passage. But I want you guys to start this new year with a hope in that empty grave and telling people what Jesus did for you. I'm going to end with a story about Donald Barnhouse. Donald Barnhouse was a pastor. I didn't even look at the date, but it was quite a ways back in history. Young pastor... They had three or four kids. I can't, I think it's four kids. His wife tragically died early in life. And uh, Barnhouse, like I said, he was a pastor and he wanted to preach his wife's funeral. Not sure I could ever do that. So he's getting ready to pastor. They're, he's preparing for her funeral. He's trying to explain to the kids about death and why this happened. He's trying to tell them like, listen, your mom's in a better place. There's hope for her because what Jesus did, he's, he's done all the stuff that pastors do for his own family. And they loaded up to go to the funeral and they pulled up to a four-way stop and they said they were sitting there at the four-way stop and a big truck was right across from them. He said it was later in the evening and there was a long shadow across the, cast across the snow. So Donald looked at the truck, looked at the shadow he said, kids, I'll ask you a question. Do you want to get hit by that truck or would you rather get hit by that shadow? He said, the kids sat there real quietly, didn't really say much. He said, finally, the youngest one piped up. He's like, dad, I don't want to get hit by the shadow. He said, the shadow ain't going to hurt me. Donald said, son, you're right. He said, that truck hit our Lord Jesus Christ. 
But that shadow is the only thing that will ever hit a believer in Jesus Christ. That shadow is the only thing that will ever cross your life. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior here on this earth, that shadow of death is the only thing that's gonna cross you, not the truck. And the truck's forever too. You're gonna spend eternity in two different places and this is what we gotta tell this lost world. If you want a life of eternity with him, you have to accept. You gotta accept that he died on the cross, that he went to that cross, that he went to that grave, that borrowed grave, and he come up three days later for you. That's it. That's the gospel. That the truck is bearing down on each one of us. The truck is coming for all of us. Right? Every day that's closer, the truck's getting closer. I gotta ask you today, is the truck gonna hit you or is the shadow gonna hit you? I don't know everybody's story in here. Guys, I sat in the church so I was 22 years old before I got saved. I was a preacher's kid. We were serving in the Baptist church when I got saved. Awesome when you're serving in church and you find Christ. When the, you look at the pastor on like a Wednesday and Sunday night, it was a night service, that's all I know. And when the pastor is like, man, what do you need to pray about? You know, Baptist church, nobody goes up front. But I did, and he's like, man, he got something going on, let's pray. He looked there and said, I gotta get saved. As he took a like a he didn't know what to do. I'm not even sure he led me through a sinner's prayer. Like he was just dumb about it. But I never want to take for granted that everyone. Because the truck is coming for us. Death is coming for us. And eternity is coming. It's coming. And this hope that we have, it should drive us to tell people that there's something better. There is something better. You can live out your salvation now. You can be happier now because he's already conquered death. He's conquered hate. He's conquered all of it on the cross. The man that knew zero sin took all the sin. The cross weighed 165 pounds when he was carrying it. Can you imagine what the weight of the world's sin was? It's an unfathomable number for a man who knew no sin to have it all. That's the gospel. He did it for you and he did it for me. So believers in this room right now, I know there's somebody in your mind you're thinking about that you know you need to try to witness to. I just ask you to, the altars are open. Come and pray for them. Pray for their soul. We can see, we can see the unfolding of the Bible. You can see the unfolding of Revelation happening. They're getting ready to sacrifice red heifers. It's the 10th red heifer ever since since Moses. They have to have this for the next temple, which is the next temple's built during the end when we're already gone. The Bible's unfolding in front of us, guys. It's awesome to be, like, isn't it awesome that he put us in this time right now? He put you in this time. It wasn't by accident. It's because somebody out there needs to hear your story of how he redeemed you. You're not just here for no reason at all. It's so easy just to live this life and stay right here and think, ah, it's fine. Somebody will reach you. What if you're the only one? So I want you to pray for people. You know, if you if you don't know Christ in here and want to know more, I'll be around. Pastor Tucker, Pastor D, Pastor Lee, anybody sitting around you will tell you about Jesus. There are so many people who find Christ in this building, and we hear about it when they're up here or over here, and I love that. That's being the hands and feet.